Welcome to the Healthcare IT Today CIO Podcast. I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today, and I'm excited to bring you the most practical healthcare CIO insights and perspectives. We know your job is challenging and we want to help you be more successful. And today's guest is a return guest, is Stephen Ramirez. He's VP and CISO at Renown Health. Welcome, Stephen. Excited to be with you. Yeah, excited for the discussion. I, I, I think coming out of all the conferences in the spring, uh, security is top of mind. So I think you'll have some great perspectives for those of us in healthcare trying to navigate it. But before we dive in there, tell us a little bit about yourself and Renowned Health. Yes, Stephen Ramirez, uh, VP and CISO at Renowned Health. We're a multi-integrated health system up in northern Nevada, um, in the Reno, Nevada yeah. area. We have a, um, <laughs> we're the area trauma hub center, uh, Children's Hospital Cancer Center. I mean, have a recent affiliation with UNR, so really excited about building that partnership to really see where we can integrate academic medicine into what we're doing. Yeah. Well, I love having a fellow uh, Nevada representative here. So, uh, you know, <laughs> since I live in Vegas, we're practically neighbors, but uh, quite a drive through the desert though to get there. But, you know, besides that, uh, tell us, what are the biggest cybersecurity threats that you see facing the healthcare industry right now? And which would you, you know, maybe call mission critical above maybe some of the others? I really see uh, third-party risk management being huge, that we're seeing that almost every day um, really increase on, you know, a lot of organizations have really helped move the needle on what they're doing. Um, you know, after COVID and building out our brick and mortar to really better secure the perimeter on that. But again, you know, as we moved with the digital transformation to do a lot of those components that COVID brought on, that's also bringing additional risk and then, you know, sassy products. So again, that's enough. Again, you could be doing the right thing, but then it's again, how can you ensure that your vendors are doing the right thing? Um, and that also ducktails into access management and the whole big mm. buzzword of zero trust that are really properly managing our access as we're moving outside of the brick and mortar again with what COVID um, did to us in healthcare. Again, you know, we really saw a lot of that model work with like remote radiologists, um, you know, having a lot of our workforce, you know, nationally dispersed, looking at a managed service partner. So again, you're seeing that that um, attack service expanding. Um, and of course, ransomware associated to that, that's really tied into um, access management as well. Um, and phishing, we're still seeing that getting, um, still being the number one attack vector. And it's only going to get better with chat GPT that we're really seeing that there's a lot of buzz on how that's going to really make those, you know, spelling errors and improper use of English sometimes to really make those um, picture perfect emails to really, you know, make even the trained security eye a little difficult um, to spot those new phishing emails. So. And by better, you mean worse. That's going to make it. Yes. Yes, <laughs> you're going to make the attackers better is what ChatGPT is going to do, which is much worse for an organization. Wow. Yes. That, that's a lot to think about. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up, and you mentioned it almost as a buzzword, the zero, you know, zero trust, right? Talk to me more about that. Like, what should a CIO know about zero trust? And, you know, should every vendor do it? Like, how, how do you see this zero trust uh, kind of buzzword evolving? Well, I think it's, yeah, started out as a buzzword and a lot of people are like, well, what does that really mean? So it's really helped evolve into more of a digital identity framework. So a lot of components that make up good um, access hygiene. I don't think we were doing that well um, in healthcare, a lot of other industries as well, just because of the different devices we have, but it's really, I guess, cultivating and combining, um, you know, standard IEM, um, privacy monitoring, um, access anomalies, third-party access, so like how our vendors are accessing different components of our systems, um, and really micro-segmentation, um, alerting, and a lot of, you know, different components that, you know, really make up how we're properly giving the keys to the kingdom. Um, and also, you know, really focusing also on like minimally necessary, like what tool sets can we do to really have more targeted access for accounts that can do most harm. So, you know, really putting a big emphasis on privilege access management, you know, micro segmenting older um, systems like our IoT and or medical devices, um, you know, in a typical hospital like that. So I think that really looking at those use cases that can do you most harm and then how you can kind of mitigate that with people, process and technology. So I think that that's really starting to formulate a little bit better um, with pulling in, you know, components of NIST, HIPAA, um, you know, 405 Diana, which we'll talk about later to really help build out um, the things we should be doing to get that zero trust methodology in an organization. Yeah, 
I mean, you bring up the third party risk that everyone is worried about. I think Kronos, you know, made us really concerned when we saw how that impacts your bottom line. Uh, but, you know, it also could be an attack vector for an organization, not just the fact that I need access to this third party system. Uh, so I, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, you, 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 last time you were on uh, the CIO podcast with us, you were at a different organization. So I, I think you have, must have a, a really interesting perspective, you know, at Renown Health now going in there and, you know, implementing your security strategy. Talk to us about what is your cyber cybersecurity strategy at Renown Health at a high level. My focus has always been early detection. So I like to use the um, healthcare hygiene. So early detection, if you can get, you know, an illness on stage one or the early onsets, the uh -huh. better you can keep it from spreading. So again, that same methodology that we're really looking at 10 to 15 minute um, detection times, how we can get tools, how we can get log sources to not only, you know, find out something, an anomaly is going on in our environment. So making that really the big Local front and also doing security basics, security 101, that instead of thinking that there's a silver bullet, a technology that's going to solve everything, really, again, if we do, you know, access management, we do MFA, we do um, vulnerability management and patching, you know, we, we get a big handle on our access management that we spoke to earlier, we vet our vendors and kind of look at the access that we can mitigate, um, that again, that's the best, the best model that we do and then build off of that. So um, that I think that you're really doing things more simple because again, that's where you can move the needle quickest and really focusing on detection, containment and that incident response because you know we're never gonna be bulletproof in what we do in our approach. So we're, we're trying to just really, again, get to a maturity level that we can mitigate risk to the point that we feel acceptable because you'll never mitigate risk across the board. So it's prioritization of those risks. And then again, using those buckets, people process technology, how are we gonna be able to mature that, you know, 30, 60, 90, you know, our year, three-year, five-year plan. I've built that out um, for our organization. So really just having a risk-based approach to all of that. Yeah. It, it's interesting to, to talk about, you know, we talked about third-party vendors being a risk for an organization, but, uh, you know, the demand for security professionals is so high. There's also the need for third-party vendors. Like I, I know you work with Clearwater, you know, talk about how working with third-party vendors to address your security needs, how does that fit into your strategy? You know, as you look at, yeah, I mean, Tahoe is a beautiful place that we're just outside of Reno where renowned that, but, you know, I'm sure it's hard to get security people there. There as well. Yeah, it is. And I've uh, really seen the shift. I mean, COVID did bring on the ability for us to hire nationwide. So that was a good thing, but then that mm -hmm. makes us more competitive with other industries. So I've been a big managed service fan because again, it's this day and age, it doesn't make sense to really build out a SOC um, within healthcare. So we're not a big enough organization to really have that cost justification. And then as you said, to really staff it um, on a 24 by seven operation would be very, very difficult. Um, so really looking at strategic partners in that area. Um, so that I've made a big focus on using that for like our SOC SIM, um, managed vulnerability management, phishing, and some other areas. So again, to help um, take off those level one, level two, level three, and then work in tandem with my team. So my team could be more tactical and strategic, um, and then working with the day-to-day -day, um, with our vendor partners. And then, as you alluded to, Clearwater is uh, one of our critical partners to help, as I spoke to our journey of risk mitigation. Um, that we do annual risk assessments um, with them to really help show our NIST security score, our technical security assessment, and then our HIPAA security alignment. So again, looking at those three buckets, they really enable us to help move um, the pieces that, you know, again, we know phishing is a critical piece. So how can we align those risks to, you know, how we stack up on the NIST framework? Uh, how are our security controls lining up to that from the technical security? And then, you know, of course, the HIPAA security compliance piece playing into all of that, you know, are we in compliance if something were to happen, you know, um, so that's really how all of that ties in. And they've really also helped us be that security assurance partner as we're starting to outsource more, um, you know, and I'm speaking to the third party risk, I use the Clearwater team to really go do security tool validations and really look at, um, you know, potential gaps with any of the partnerships we have. So they're very, I'm really serving as like our almost security internal security audit team, as well as assurance practice um, within my team. So really helping drive that strategy on that risk-based approach. Yeah. And it's probably a benefit because they work with so many organizations. You're benefiting from the work and the analysis they've done in other organizations as well, I would I would think. Yeah, definitely. They're able to baseline us um, against healthcare to show us really, um, you know, are we a one out of five on, you know, this aspect of NIST, on, on this part of, you know, the TSA to again show us, 
where healthcare is as a general, you know, where they're a bit different client bases. So that's really been something meaningful to show my executive team to say, again, this is where we started to really show that security journey from us starting here. And then our maturity level as we're going through utilizing the COVID model to say your strategic investments in this, for example, for us to go to this managed service partner has moved like our detection to a three from like a, say a 1.9 to a three. So it's really saying, you know, this targeted investment has showed that. So it's been a great way for us to almost show their report card on how we're moving the needle from a maturity level and that ROI on funding with, you know, funding being so scarce this day and age with the kind of payer mix and, you know, everything with um, hospital organizations, um, you know, really fighting for the bottom line right now. Yeah. Boards love to see that their investment's actually making progress. And <laughs> it's sometimes hard to show that when you're like, hey, we didn't have a breach. <laughs> like, they're like, should we keep investing? So that's good to put a number to it. You know, you talked a lot about the kind of this ongoing risk analysis and that's your, your approach. You know, we've really seen a shift in security from kind of putting up firewalls to this con- continuous risk analysis, where are we at in kind of that shift of thinking like, oh, can we just put up walls versus actually, you know, doing this ongoing analysis of the risks associated with our organization? Well, a good defense is a good offense. So we have to look at it, not only of just, you know, putting up our defenses and just waiting for the punch. You've got to go out there and look for who might be punching you is the analogy I'm Mm -hmm. looking at. And how can we continually assess, monitor and do that health check? So again, Tying it back to that healthcare hygiene, we're really looking at doing those health checks to see, okay, this was our biggest risk Um, last year, um, you know, this new ransomware gang came out or, um, you know, this is a, you know, critical vendor that we're using really just continuing to look at um, what's changing in the landscape, you know, we're seeing from a regulatory standpoint, um, especially that there's a lot of lawsuits now that follow a, a breach. So not only are you worrying about OCR, you have a potential litigation. We also saw that Moody came out in our recent article that you'll have a credit downgrade. So it's like you're almost looking at three or four um, potential impacts after that on top of you know OCR coming in to look at that. So we're saying, well, what aspects might lead to that to come up to show um, us not doing the right thing? Um, and then that's all driven to, again, that risk assessment that we're doing. Um, Again, showing that maturity, showing our weakness. Is that something that, again, you can't mitigate all risks? So is that something that ultimately we can just accept the risk or have a mitigating control in and really help paint that picture into our roadmap to really, again, let our executive team and board know that this is, you know, really where we stand from a um, cyber hygiene standpoint um, yeah, what would you suggest to a healthcare organization though that has taken kind of a a check the box compliance? Hey, we did our security risk analysis check. Now let's move on. <laughs> you know, I think there's a fair number of organizations that that's how they've approached it. Maybe they have some ongoing HIPAA training or something, right? To I mean, what you describe is more of this holistic kind of continuous approach to cybersecurity. What should healthcare organizations be doing to to shift that mindset? It's yeah, it's more than just a check the box or you're going to be a headline. So it's again, you got to really make that focus on it's almost like training for any kind of sport or studying for a test. If you don't continually learn, train, adapt that you're going to just, um, you know, you don't need to be going for that just passing grade because that's going to put you at risk. So it's really about, you know, pushing the needle and really um, looking at what puts your organization most at risk, you know, being affiliated with academic medicine, you know, a a trauma hospital and, um, you know, your different partnerships, what's in-source, outsource, how's your team dispersed? So again, not, not all risks are the same. We know phishing for one will hit every organization, but, you know, and the means which you operate um, and do business, like we have an insurance subsidiary. So that gives us different risks than maybe another, you know, rural health system on that. So, um, and then our impact would be bigger being, you know, um, our trauma center, you know, having a children's hospital, you know, so you really have to look at all of that when you're looking at your risk assessment and then how you deliver care. I mean, then take that step back to really see what risk equivocate to that when we're putting together our um, agile defense in depth that, you know, really aligned to a lot of what we're doing in cybersecurity. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the biggest uh, pieces of news I've seen recently was, uh, you know, you alluded to earlier, the 405D, the public-private effort to really collaborate on healthcare industry security practices. What what do you think of this effort and, you know, how should a healthcare organization kind of process what's happening with 405D? 
And I'm a member of that. It's awesome work that they're doing to help bring awareness. Um, Eric Decker's doing an awesome job championing that in the industry. And they just had that big kickoff to a lot of those new strategic initiatives that we're doing at HIMSS. Uh -huh. They're really excited to see that stuff. And I think it makes it, a, you know, when I was speaking to Security 101, I think it's a great way to provide free resources, um, but also to really boil the ocean down to key elements that um, healthcare organizations should be focusing on because not every hospital has the same budget, doesn't have the same team, doesn't have all the same risk. So again, that I think the 405D is really taking that holistic approach to what are we seeing in rural um, or clinic-based, you know, smaller organizations, the bigger systems, and how can we, you know, just say these are some best practices that you can really do to, you know, improve your security posture. So I think it's been a great effort. Um, a lot of the meetings that we attend, you know, have multi-healthcare um, industry partners to really collaborate and give that kind of best practice vantage point. So I think that's why what's going to make that really successful. It's taking kind of the best of breed of a lot of elements and a lot of players in healthcare to, again, you know, give us a good playbook and strategy to, um, again, really just to move the needle. Because there's a lot of healthcare organizations that don't have the budget, budget don't necessarily have um, a CISO. Um, so it's like, again, it, it gives, gives those tools. We used a lot of those elements in our recent, um, in October, Cybersecurity Awareness Month that some of the um, content they provided was better than the you know, security partners that we're, we're paying. So it's like a lot of what they're doing do have better, more targeted awareness and training efforts. So it's, I'm really excited to see you know, the work that that group has done and what they'll continue to do to better the industry. Yeah, and I think that is something that a lot of people don't understand. They, they see this thing, you know, public-private partnership, all the big names behind it, and they think, well, does that apply to me in my rural or my, <laughs> my smaller practice? But it sounds like the effort has been like, hey, this can work for everyone, right? And they do have subgroups that take all of that into mind. So it's not like we're just you know, throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping sure. something sticks. We're making sure we have those players at the table. So that's where, again, you're making sure that we do have that valuable feedback and that's you know, really baked into everything with those healthcare lens. Um, yeah. So I think that's what's really exciting and going to provide a lot of value to, um, you know, those smaller hospitals and my hospital. You know, we learn a lot on that. There's a lot of good publication um, that comes out to that that we use and for training and awareness um, or board presentations. Yeah. And I, I think we're going to be talking a lot of 405D. It uh, feels like it's a baseline for a lot what's going to happen in security and healthcare. So thanks. You know, we always like to wrap up these uh, these episodes with a little career uh, narrative and uh, advice. Uh, and I'd love to hear from you. What advice would you give someone who maybe is just starting out in healthcare security? Healthcare security is unlike anything else. So you have to, you know, understand that you're never going to be able to mitigate all risk. There's, mm -hmm. you know, we have dated OS. We have that expanded attack surface with medical device IoT that really our ecosystem is what makes us um, you know, such a soft target and, you know, us not having the big, big budgets, like a lot, a lot of other industry. So being nimble, being adaptive and being able to focus on, um, low hanging fruit. And again, you know, being patient because again, it does take a lot, um, with ultimately a lot of the systems we do, do impact patient care. So you have to be a little pragmatic in your approach to make sure that you're not interrupting operations. Cause again, like every other industry that if you, go patch a device that's being used for patient care. Um, you know, you can impact, you know, patient safety, but you could also interrupt operations and then you have downturn financial, et cetera, all of that. So you have to just, again, it's, it's unlike anything else. It's never a boring day, but again, it's something that you want to be like a chameleon and, you know, just be adaptive and um, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Steven, I appreciate you coming on uh, again to share these insights and perspectives, uh, you know, I, I think we you have plenty of job security. Security is not going anywhere. It's just getting more complicated. As you mentioned, chat GPT, et cetera, is accelerating the, the attacks. And, and, and the attack surface is getting bigger as we deploy more devices and connect more and more interoperability, et cetera. So I appreciate you taking the time. And thanks, everyone, for watching and listening. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com or search for the CIO podcast by Healthcare IT Today on your favorite podcast application. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having me.